Hey guys, Urban Combat Survivor here. I got a question via private message some time ago, and uh, I've been chewing it over because I wasn't sure if I was going to do a video on this. Uh, I don't think that I'm the most qualified person to answer this question. I think there are others that are far more qualified than I am for this. Um, as a matter of fact, I think the person who asked me the question is more qualified than I am to answer this question. So, I don't know why the question came to me. Uh, I don't know why you want my thoughts on this. But, uh, I wanted to really think about it and, uh, and give the best answer that I could give. Um, this is a question, this is something I've thought about before. And, uh... Well, uh, like I said, uh, I mean, I have my own opinion on it, but I, I really didn't think that I was the person that should be making a video like this. Um, I'm not going to throw your name out there. I, I don't know if you want people to know who you are and uh, and what you do. Uh, so if you'd like to, uh, you know, let people know via comment or in a video response or anything like that uh, who you are, then, then I'm going to leave that decision up to you. I'm not going to throw you out there like that, but... Um, I'm going to read parts of this. I'm not going to read it all because I don't want to give away too much of uh, his information. But um, but I, I can I can read parts. I think without being too specific. Um, it starts out. I have kind of a loaded question. I would love to get your opinion on. I live within ten miles of a military installation. Uh, skip skip. In a WRL situation, what do you think will happen with the military? I'm a vet and also work on said installation as a civilian, and I'm not going to give your jobs out. Uh, I supervise and train young soldiers in those specific jobs. And though we get many exemplary men, I find many, if not most, are lacking in their understanding of the Constitution. I fear that a small percentage of the military could be a problem for the surrounding area. Not those outstanding troops, but that bottom-of-the-barrel don't-care group which unfortunately has increased in numbers over the last few years. Just wanted to get your take on the subject. Hope I made sense. Well, yeah, you made perfect sense. Um, and as you are a vet who works on a military installation, and I am not a vet uh, and have never worked on a military installation, I don't know why my opinion would, uh, would really be asked for, but I'm going to try to give the best answer that I can give, and I hope that it's... Um, satisfactory. I don't. I don't really know um, what qualifies me for this, but here goes. What I think is that the military is kind of easily broken down into a few categories, and if you want to get more specific than those few categories, it comes becomes more difficult. But I think you have those who join the military because they want to serve their country, because they love this country. And, um, and they're patriotic and they want it to serve. And then I think you have those who joined the military for whatever benefits they may have joined for, whether it's the GI Bill or, um, or the training that they could get in the military or um, <clears throat> etc. And I think pretty much things are going to divide along those lines as to how positive uh, those people are going to be in a breakdown situation if it ever happens. I think those who are patriotic um, are very likely to be much like uh, Hibernia Sun, Southern Prepper One, Haas USMC, people who are patriotic and and are preparing. And and look, you're, you're military. You know uh, Uncle Sam tells you guys to be ready. I mean, soldiers uh, are told to have a certain uh, amount of emergency preparedness at home. And uh, you should be aware of that. Everybody who's been in the military should be aware of that. Um, but those who haven't uh, are not, so that's why I'm mentioning it. Uh, I think that there are a lot of patriots in our military who will come down on, on I guess, what I would consider our side um, of, of the, the, you know, the events that break down. And uh, now you go to the other category, those who are there for, for certain benefits or training. And I think that subcategory can be easily split into two subcategories. Those who are there for some benefit to further their careers or their lives or their education, and those that are there for the military training so that they can take that home and teach others. And uh, that second category is the one that I'm worried about. Many um, 
if not all major gangs, uh, pretty much all of them, I think, uh, have folks who join our military and learn military tactics and then take that home and teach other people in the gang. They actually train other people in their gang. Um, this is true if you look at uh, MS-13 um, from El Salvador. Those guys started out as uh, as a group of a group of folks who were trained by United States Special Forces to go in there and take out the uh, you know the bad element, the drug cartels and stuff like that. And those guys turned around, took out the drug cartels, and took over the business. And um, you know that gang. Um, you know, it's made it all the way into the United States and all the way through the entire United States. And those guys train. Those guys absolutely train, and many of them join the military. And they're not the only gang that does that. Many of them do. And I think a lot of the uh, the more base element that you're talking about, uh, a lot of them are probably those, those guys that have joined from gangs. And, uh, you know, I've seen various statistics thrown out there of guys that are, you know, gang affiliated that are in the military and I've seen it the highest number I think I saw was 15 percent of our military is affiliated with gangs in some manner not necessarily directly gang gang members but um, I don't know how believable any of those numbers are I don't think anybody has a solid um, you know a solid number on exactly how many but I wouldn't be surprised if it's 10 percent or or 15 percent anywhere between you know, five and fifteen percent, I think, is probably a fair number. So those guys, I think, are going to be a direct problem. Um, so I think you probably have fifteen percent on the bottom end that are going to be that are going to be a big problem to uh, to not just those of us that are preparing, but to the population at large. And then I think you have the other end of the spectrum, and I think that's probably about fifteen percent of uh, of people who are in the military who are true patriots. That, that are there because they love their country. And I think they're going to fall on our side of things. And uh, it's the 60% in the middle there, um, or 70% in the middle there, I mean, depends on what numbers you're working with, that I, I think are just basically going to be like the rest of the population, you know? Um, it also depends on how a breakdown happens because... If it's an all of a sudden thing, uh, I'm sure that the military will be deployed in some manner to try to restore order. Uh, the situation that I think is more likely is that it's it's more gradual, and I've seen a uh, a tendency in progressive uh, presidents and progressive congresses that. Uh, that they will continue cutting funding for for the military. So a lot of these guys, I think, are going to be sent home, and um, a lot of these guys are deployed. How many uh, how many guys do we have overseas right now? We have, you know, fifty thousand in uh, Afghanistan, uh, twenty thirty thousand, I think, still in Iraq, maybe more, um, thirty thousand in Germany, I believe. How many tens of thousands in uh, on the Korean Peninsula? So. You know, of our military, how many of them are actually here is, is a question. Um, I don't know. I don't know the number. I don't know the answer to that. So, again, uh, you're a vet, so I, I really don't know what answer I can give you that you don't already have, um, what knowledge you don't have that's, uh, that's more relevant than mine. So, you know, I'm just trying to, uh, trying to give you a thinker's perspective, I guess. So, uh, how's that going to come down? Um... I think the equipment on those military bases, not not just active military bases like you're talking about, but National Guard depots where things are stored and that kind of thing, uh, I think a lot of preppers are planning on going and taking that stuff. Uh, I also think the preppers probably aren't the only ones who are going to have that idea. And it may well be that there are a lot of battles fought at those National Guard depots and at those military installations because... Uh, even if they're stone empty most of the time, if something goes down, I think there's going to be a lot of people that think, oh, let me get over there and get some of that stuff. And uh, who, knows gonna, who knows who's going to get there first and who's going to get there at the same time, you know? So uh, I think planning 
definitively on having any of that equipment that's not in your hands right now is probably uh, probably poor planning. Uh, I wouldn't. I'd, I'd put it on a wish list maybe, uh, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't plan on definitely having any of that. So, if what you're talking about is uh, a scenario, and this is one that I've really avoided talking about, a scenario of something like martial law, then, again, I think what it's going to come down to is, I mean, I agree, most people, not just in the military, most people in general have never read the Constitution, so they don't really understand it. Um, they don't teach it in school anymore. Uh, school kids really don't learn constitutional, uh, you know, philosophy. They don't have civics classes anymore. And, uh, hell, they didn't have civics classes when I was in school. So, I don't know. I guess uh, the generation before mine that was there may have had them, but, but I certainly didn't. I had to learn all this um, on my own through just a, a will to understand my country. And, uh, and I guess most people just don't, don't ever have that, that drive to go do that. Um, I've said before that I think the Constitution is absolutely the most important document, the most important preparation anybody can make, in my opinion, is to put down at least one copy of the Constitution. Um, I do more than one, two, three, five, ten, however many you can get. Um, print them out. There's copies on the internet that you can that you can print out and just put in different different places. But you know, those who don't understand the Constitution, if they were to be deployed against our own population. I don't know. I think that's going to be, uh, just like any other situation, I think it's going to come down to individuals. And, you know, I know I know a lot of folks in the military, and uh, I've had a couple of pretty extensive conversations with some of them. And a very good friend of mine, we were talking about this years ago. Not exactly this, but we were having a conversation. And he told me that... <clears throat> Everybody who goes through basic training is told that they have to abide by by international law. <coughs> Excuse me. And that any order that comes down that's illegal, they're responsible for their own actions. So if they follow an illegal order, they know that they're responsible if if and when it comes down and it gets out that that went down. They are responsible for their own actions. They cannot rely on, um, I was following orders. And, now I don't know how many, uh, you know, the, the guy I'm talking about is, he's a pretty intelligent dude, so, I don't know how many soldiers actually pay attention to this. And I don't know that it's every branch of the military that, that really pushes that, um, or at least says it. I believe that it is, but I'm not going to state that as a fact. Uh, I'm sure other people know whether or not that's uh, the case so uh, it's going to come down to individuals how many of them are going to really think about that and even if they don't think about the legalities of it how many of them have a mom at home that they're thinking I'm not going to go shoot somebody else's family because I don't want somebody else to go shoot my family how many of them are just going to say screw this and go home um, I think that's going to be much more quickly done by local law enforcement than it is by the military. But at some point, I think the, a lot of a lot of soldiers are going to head home too, if they can. And uh, you know, the ones that are in the states anyway. So, what do I think is going to happen with the military? I think those bases are probably going to be raided by whoever gets there first, or whoever gets there with the most force. And I also think that many of those bases are likely to be taken over, um, if not by military themselves who are trying to secure the base, um, then elements who, who got in there and wanted the equipment. It's certainly something to consider. Um, you know, it has the potential, you know, one of the biggest threats that I can think of is what happens with the prison population. If, uh, if there's no power and there's no more food and water being delivered, what happens? Do the guards just let those people go? Do they leave them in their cells to, to die? If they do leave them in their cells, how many of them are going to break out and find some way to get loose? Um, you know, I mean, people in prison are nothing if not ingenuitive with coming up with uh, tools and, and weapons, right? So, 
I think as big a threat as those prisons are, uh, the every military base, every National Guard depot has the potential to be an even greater threat. So, again, I, I don't know what, what made you feel I was qualified to give an answer on this. And I'm sorry that it took me so long to do an answer, but I really wanted to think it over. So, uh, but all I can do is give you the best answer that I can, uh, that I can give you, one that is as honest as I can be with it. So, uh, so there's my answer for anybody who's still watching. Um, I think it's going to come down to individuals. And, and if you're working with those young soldiers, maybe now is a good time for you to uh, to start planting some seeds and some heads, man. You know, not everybody's going to be receptive, but it takes about an hour to read the Constitution as it was originally written. You know, read the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. It takes it takes an hour, and uh, it may take a little longer than that to uh, to really understand it. But you know, they're soldiers, so uh, I don't see that they would be any problem for you uh, with you know with your bosses. I don't know that it would be any problem at all for you to suggest, you know, read the Constitution, guys. Understand this stuff. Um, maybe during lunch breaks and stuff like that, start start planting that seed. Every soldier should know the Constitution just as much as any citizen should know the Constitution. So, um, yeah, I see it being a potential threat, and the best solution I can give you is is exactly that. Try try planting some seeds now, and uh, you know what? Not just with the young guys. Maybe, uh, you know, if you can have a conversation with some of those older soldiers that are there, uh, some of the older airmen, and, uh, and plant that seed with them, too. Those that are mentoring these young guys might be able to plant a seed uh, as effectively or more effectively than you can or I could. So, uh, so give it a shot. Uh, I didn't want to discuss the problem without offering some kind of solution, and uh, I think many of them would be receptive to sitting down for an hour and reading the Constitution. So, you know, maybe give that a go. Um, as for other solutions, I'm sure there are many, but I think that's probably the best one that, that we could come up with. Uh, I hope I, uh, I hope I answered your question adequately and, uh, and answered the question as I understood it. Um, I hope I got, I got what you were looking for there. Urban Combat Survivor, signing off.